Well, primary backup recording. Right. So the, we will we will make this recording available um, <clears throat> for everybody um, after this recording's done. I'll, I'll do a quick edit, a few things, and we're ready to go. So anyway, let me start with the sharing of the screen and uh, show you and talk a little bit about what we're going to do today, and we will go from there. And you can hear my dog in the background. As soon as I have to start talking, my dog is Maggie, be quiet. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so he gets up and leaves. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I want to say, first off, welcome, everybody. Um, this is quite a, a fun thing we're about to begin again. Uh, if any of us uh, remember back into the pandemic, John Cordicello, who is uh, listed here, and he'll have a moment to share some of his uh, history in wild and how he started this, um, started a, uh, a weekly program called Photo Conversations. And uh, as it turns out, he was much more ambitious than you can imagine because he was doing, what, one or two of these a week, John? Yeah, one to two a week. Two a week. I, I, we're having a hard <clears> enough time just trying to get it put together so we can do one every two weeks, which I know, right now we're, we, we do have guests lined up through March. Um, and this is a chance for all of us as photographers to get together and basically have a chat. Um, as you will see here in the format, uh, what I want to do be before we go too further is we'll do the introductions in a minute. We'll do uh, how this began. John will give it to us. What our objectives are for what we're trying to do and then host presentations. Uh, we, each of us have maybe a 10 minute presentation to share with you about something we're working on and you know, photography wise. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about who our next guest is, who you probably have seen already will be Russell. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we'll open the floor up for general discussions. Um, please keep your microphones on mute if you're not muted already. And if you have questions or anything, you can throw them in the chat or just wait till we open up uh, the questions and we'll go from there. Uh, so as I would like to go here, let's see where we got to go. I want, this is Russell uh, Preston Brown. He'll be our next speaker and um, let's get this thing rolling. So I'm going to turn off screen sharing and uh, I'm going to let John come on and tell us a little bit about the past and uh, how this all began. Okay, well, a couple of years ago, we had this little pandemic thing starting up, and I was a, primarily a headshot photographer, and all of a sudden, I couldn't have anyone in the studio. <clears throat> and I um, was kind of getting bored with things, so I called a few friends local and said, hey, do you want to do a Zoom, this new Zoom thing that's happening? Uh, there was Dan Cooney. I wanted to come on and talk about lighting, and then we talked about some collecting cameras. Uh, Ken Yu was in a photo assistant. He came on. Um, then I realized I had a lot of friends that I had worked with at Creative Live over the years. So I got people like Matthew Jordan Smith, um, Lindsay Adler, a few others to come on. Um, and it just started growing from there. Uh, originally it started, I was going to do online tutorials, but then it turned into doing these here, um, interviews and presentations by photographers. And all of a sudden I was doing two a week and, after about two years, I finally burnt out on it. Uh, a lot of preparation goes into these things, uh, getting out the mailing list and putting the graphics together and all the like. And I, so I ended them in 2022. And since then, Holger's been on my back about restarting them. And then you got Jeff and Kevin on me too. And here we are. Um, so we've had some fun ones over the time and I hope we get this thing going again. But not quite as ambitious, maybe once every two weeks now instead of twice a week. You're muted. Oh. Uh, Better bring my mic. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great in, in life if we could just hit mute buttons for anybody we were talking to? <laughs> just boom, <laughs> mute them away. All right. So um, I'm going to let Jeff go first with a little bit about uh, where we're going. But let, let, before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what we're we're trying to do here. Um, I started Photo PXL after I left Luminous Landscape. Um, and by the way, for anybody that remembers Luminous Landscape, it is now under new ownership. Um, a guy named John Swindle, uh, which is kind of a <laughs> weird last name to have, 
but uh, he's he's bought uh, Luminous Landscape and he's trying to to resurrect it. He's a really nice guy. Um, I didn't get along very well with the last guy, as you will probably all might be aware. But uh, we got new blood in there, and uh, I certainly welcome uh, a new resource for uh, people that are interested in photography. Maybe I'll have him as a, a guest and share a little bit about what he does and what he's trying to do. But um, after I left Luminous Landscape, we uh, put together Photo PXL since most of every well everybody that was on the Luminous Landscape uh, owned, you know team wise came over here with me. So uh, here we are, and um, I'm all about the, the the community, all about making a community of photographers uh, that enjoy and love photography as much as I do, and have the ability to uh, enjoy photography where they can. But I think part of the enjoyment about photography, like what I get when I do workshops, is the fact that we're better as a collective than we are sometimes as an individual. Um, we have a lot of fun when we can discuss photography together. We learn a lot from each other. And that's what this really is. So my plan is, uh, and our plan is, to do these every other week and bring a special guest photographer in who will do a presentation, um, at which time when it's over, you can ask questions of that photographer and also we'll have kind of an open forum. Uh, we might take a break every other month or something and uh, do the four of us and talk a little bit about the photography industry. Um, one of the guests that we will be doing, hopefully, we might be somebody from the Roberts camera to talk a little bit about where the photography industry and the camera market's going these days, which is kind of wild, but uh, that'll be a topic for another discussion. Um, so anyway, I'm very happy that John and Holger and Jeff have uh, joined forces. It's nice to have a team uh, to be able to do these with. And uh, I hope you enjoy this. We're always open to ideas, at which time when we're finished this little presentations of the what we want to do here, we'll open up the floor. And if any of you have ideas or ideas for speakers and formats and things like that, um, please let us know. And you can always email uh, myself or John, Jeff, and, and Holger, and we'll, we'll take care of seeing what we can do. So we're very open to making this a forum uh, and a community for all of us and all photographers. Um, each of these uh, conversations and chats that we do will be recorded so that others that can't make it for one reason or another um, can uh, catch up and, and be part of it. And John did a great <laughs> job of doing his uh, recordings. And like I said, if you haven't seen some of his, and there's some really good ones, uh, there is a listing of those in the original article that we put up about doing these photo chats. So at this time, I'm going to turn the screen over to the one and only Jeff, me, and uh, he's the only guy with a really good background, perfect lighting, and if you could see his setup, you wouldn't believe what went into making this. Uh, you notice he's got the three to one ratio, blah, 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 on his lighting backgrounds there, and oh, there we go. <laughs> So anyway, Jeff, it's all yours. Uh, you got ten minutes. in front of the curtain. Yeah, well, don't go behind the curtain. Yeah, so there's gonna... nothing behind the curtain. Um, so Jeremy, nice wig, by the way, bud. <laughs> <laughs> I asked uh, Jeremy. Who's holding uh, your honor? Yeah, or thank you. If because uh, <laughs> he's a barrister in in England, if he had to wear his uh, a wig to court, and he said yes, so now he put it on. Uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Shiwi, and I am a photography addict. Um, if any of you have ever been to an AA meeting, that's how everybody introduces themselves. Well, actually, not last name, but I'm not anonymous. Um, the one thing that we wanted to do, particularly since we're going to have relatively large crowds, um, uh, is to have a sense of decorum superior to the house of representatives and the Senate. So um, uh, while we're not averse to foul language because there are a lot of fucking New Yorkers in the group and you know the F word is not uncommon in, in New York. Um, the thing that we wanna do is to have this to be a safe, fun place. So no idiots or assholes. Um, we ask that everybody keep their um, uh, microphones muted um, because 
well, we don't really want to hear what you have to say until you take a moment to think before speaking. So uh, down at the bottom, there's a thing called reactions. And you should be able to raise your hand uh, and let uh, the host at the moment um, uh, basically call on you and say, okay, um, uh, go ahead, Jeremy, and, and make a comment, or Ian, or any of the uh, other people, um, because uh, we don't want a lot of people talking at once, because in the Zoom format, it can turn into a clusterfuck. Um, and so the thing about it is we don't want any um, personal interactions of a <clears throat> verbally violent nature. You all get what I'm saying. So no, um, no uh, name calling or, well, I, you know, I may occasionally call Kevin an idiot, but <clears throat> I do love him like a brother. So uh, that is the nature of the terms of service. Uh, you'll get one warning and you won't get a second warning. You'll be booted from the island. That's it, Kevin. Okay. So do you want to uh, do a little presentation or do you have anything that oh. you want to share with the group? Sure. Okay. So um, one of the things that uh, I have to credit uh, Alan Brio, uh, who I've done some workshops with down in the Pacific Southwest, uh, when I retired from commercial advertising photography, I was kind of adrift. Um, I did do a couple of books and, you know, I've done workshops and teaching and stuff like that. But uh, I had a whole bunch of photography that I didn't know what to do with. So what I did was uh, started doing projects. And one of the projects that I did was creating folios. Now, I think of folios as different than portfolios. Folios are just a group of images that kind of could hang together if you were going to do a show. Um, and so particularly during the pandemic, one of the things that I did was, uh, because I couldn't go anywhere, um, well, I did two things. I went back through my archives, and then I photographed my cat. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it moves. It's cute. How can you not? love cat pictures. So I literally in my, uh, and I can pull them up sometime if you want to see them, I've got 10,000 uh, images of Phoebe the cat in my uh, Lightroom catalog. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, but the th some of them are really nice. And in fact, if you're Facebook on Facebook, if you go to hashtag Phoebe photos, F-O-T-O-S, you can see some of the postings that I've uh, posted on Phoebe. She, she's got a fan club. So uh, the thing that I thought I would show you is one of the folios that I did that was uh, particularly successful last year. So I'm gonna share my screen. And I think you guys can see this, is that correct? Yes, we see it. Uh, I'm going to go now, are you, seen this in full screen? Pretty much full yes. screen, yep. Okay, You're looking good. So one of the things that I did, and, and Kevin, um, and uh, I don't know who else was with us, uh, but uh, I've been to Antarctica three times. Kevin's been there like 24 times, which is excessive. But um, what I did was I went back through my Antarctic stuff um, and and mined for hidden gems in black and white. So this is my black and white in Antarctica. Um, the Gerlich Strait, uh, one of the things that I love about Antarctica is the, um, when you get in there and punch up the contrast and uh, deepen down the blacks and uh, add some texture, um, you get these wonderful uh, textural sculptural effects on icebergs. Um, this is another one, a, a wave uh, uh, crashing over the side of an iceberg. Wind, wept, uh, wind swept waves. Um, there's a thing called catabatic winds. The winds come down off of the, the mountains and the, and the uh, uh, glaciers and it like 
really strong winds that are is really fucking cold. Um, and so uh, it's interesting to watch what happens to the effect. Um, just the sculptural effect, and in this case, this was a shot from a Zodiac. Uh, and you think, well, you're shooting from a Zodiac, yeah. But you got to understand that there are eight or nine other photographers in the same Zodiac all vying to photograph. And it's a little bit like being on the sidelines of, uh, I don't know, Taylor Swift and, and at the Super Bowl. Um, it can get kind of vicious elbowing each other to get the shot. Um, but one of the things that we, and I think you can see this if you look in, uh, you can see the little penguin tracks on the iceberg. Uh, but one of the great things about shooting in Antarctica is that uh, half the time you're shooting from a boat that is moving slow enough that you can kind of really frame and compose the photos. Um, this was shot in the iceberg graveyard. Normally, they don't let you get up close because an iceberg can flip. And uh, they make us wear uh, life preservers that automatically inflate if they're if you're if it's hit with salt water which is handy they call them life preservers but they're actually body recovery devices because if if you go in the water the water here is probably 33 degrees um uh, celsius or uh, uh, fahrenheit if you go in the water you get about three or four minutes to get out of the water uh, before you die from hypothermia so literally being able to take a, a Zodiac and cruise under an iceberg was special. Um, just the textural effects of the ice and the shapes is what dragged me into doing this. Um, this one also in the, in the uh, uh, iceberg graveyard, um, and just the sculptural effects of the wind and the water, remarkable. And this was, I've never oh, seen, man, that was I've only been there three times, but uh, I've never seen an iceberg quite like this. Uh, I mean, it's like this was a set built in Hollywood um, or, you know, uh, an AI CGI creation. This couldn't be real, right? But it was. And this one is one of my favorite ones, a tabular iceberg. And this is actually a pretty small one. But when I say small, it's probably 150 to 250 foot tall. And remember, 90% uh, of an iceberg is underwater. So 150 foot tall and maybe six to eight blocks wide. That's how big it was. Uh, so just to give you an example, uh, this, what started out as a folio now is going to be a portfolio and may end up being a book and also a folio of prints for sale. Uh, but I, I did this folio. I selected 10 images to black and white issue of shadow and light. Um, one of the, uh, images was in the water um, uh, at Amanda Smith Gallery. Uh, then the image, uh, uh, the images from the Shadow and Light magazine, I submitted as a um, uh, editorial collection for Communication Arts, and it was accepted. I was tickled to death. Um, and then uh, the Black and White in Antarctica was selected for the Critical Mass finalist by Photo Lucida. I, Final 200 out of, I don't know, eight or 10,000. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't make the final 50, but that's okay. Um, then a uh, portfolio of images uh, from black and white in Antarctica was selected for the R photo folio selection. And one of my images, Iceberg Graveyard, now is currently hanging uh, at the um, uh, Southeast Center for Photography group show. I thought I'd show you this because I've been in communication arts before in the past. I never actually entered myself. Uh, and so this time I entered and it was accepted, which meant that I got the actual statue. I had never gotten a CA uh, uh, award statue and I thought this was cool. So I had to take a photograph and, and uh, Tim Anderson, who was the publisher was tickled to death. And then Anne Hart, 
uh, was the art director. So that's basically uh, that. Now I did want to show that's what I have been. Oh, I've got to move this around. Okay, uh, that's what I had been working on. This year I've got a new project, and some of these people you may recognize. Um, I'm going to be doing a book, photographers in front of my camera. Uh, and uh, Kevin's there in the upper right. Um, some of the people that are there is Jay Maisel, uh, John Paul Caponegro, uh, Kim Weston, um, Stephen Johnson, Matt Colbert. Uh, Greg Gorman. Greg Gorman. Uh, um, Russell Brown. This, this fellow here is, is fun. Uh, he's a fellow brother. by the name of Thomas Noel. You may know him from Photoshop. He's actually a really good photographer, uh, which is one of the reasons that uh, uh, Photoshop and Camera Raw is, is so useful for photographers. Uh, I, I do have John here, and I, I wanted to... Doesn't he look cherubic? <laughs> and then, of course, he got creative with me, which I think is cool. Uh, so anyway, I'm in the process of collecting a bunch of heads. Uh, Joe, I got you. I, in fact, oops. Where'd Joe go? There it is. Um, I, I did a little bit of retouching, Joe, to make you look a little bit less, um, uh, shall we say, textural. It's about uh, and time. then, of course, I had to, I had to do a self-portrait. Uh, and then this is one of my favorite ones recently done because I've been doing a lot of workshops um, and I, I had photographed this. I, I photographed Dwayne Michaels at a lecture and I just, I, I don't know, sitting there shooting with a Sony 100 and I did like a hundred shots of, of him. So I ended up taking a workshop from Dwayne Michaels, four and a half days of unmitigated insanity and creativity, uh, a wonderful experience. I'm still getting over it. Uh, but in preparation for the show, I decided to take some of the images that I had shot of Dwayne and make a collage of, of Dwayne, because he talks with his hands. Uh, and he loved it. And yeah, I've given really him a, I, I gave him a, uh, a copy of the print. I said, can you autograph this print for me? So he did. And But he likes to write captions on photos. So he wrote, don't touch the artist, Dwayne Michaels. Um, so that's what I'm, uh, what, I, what, what I did last year. And then this year, um, I'm going to be shooting a bunch of people out, well, in the next year, I'm going to be shooting portraits of a bunch of photographers. So I may call on some of you. I am looking for um, more diversity. So women, um, uh, <laughs> Suzanne, but it's a long way down to Arizona. I might get there. So that's it, Kevin. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. That felt was um, <laughs> inspiring as always. And looking back at a lot of those icebergs, especially since we were on the, those same trips, um, they really um, that that one that we showed that you you said looked like a Hollywood set. A lot of people say it looks like the Parthenon. I say it looks like a bunch of asses sitting at a bar on bar stools. <laughs> so everybody sees something different in it. Holger, would you like yes, to sir. do your uh, segment now, please? Yeah, let me see whether I can actually share the screen. <clears throat> share on the desktop. Oops. Oh, it says something about privacy. That's great. <clears throat> I think we, okay, me... why don't you let people know where you're located? Oh, let's see. About <clears throat> this. It doesn't let me uh, share the screen, actually. Oh, uh, didn't we not set you up for that? I mean, we just did that a minute I ago. I hope so. It's on, it's on your side, Hogar. You need to give permission to your computer to, I think, to... Are you on a Mac or PC? Mac. Oh, okay. I never had that. I don't know. 
Uh, John, maybe you can walk him through it. Well, John Ian. I'm I'm not sure. It's it's probably somewhere in your Mac settings. What's what's it say to you on the screen? Does it say yeah, it says something so? about the uh, uh, security setting in the preferences? Let me see. Yeah. I'm so sorry that happens to me. Why didn't it happen to me? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the new operating systems make you check off a lot of boxes, um, unfortunately. So um, if you'd like, while you're trying to figure that out, I'll go ahead and do mine. If you got the, yeah. yours taken yeah, care yeah. of, uh, then that we can come sense. back to that if that's okay. All right? Absolutely. Perfect. So hang on a second. Uh, keynote, share. So can everybody see that? Rust. Rust, uh, an obsession? Yep. Okay, yes. good. Um, so like Jeff is working on a lot of his um, projects, um, one of the things that I was always taught from when I was in college was, you know, if you can work on, on a project. And I did have done a lot of workshops with Art Wolf, and he does his projects as books. And he might be working on six books at one time five six years in advance so he knows what books he's working on and he's trying to um, fill the uh, the library from the uh, for those books from different places that he goes and visits i have many uh, projects that i'm working on but something that i've always had an obsession with is is rust and so i'm going i have hundreds of rust images by the way and i can do uh you know programs for photo clubs and other things along the way but uh, what i find is that i challenge myself with the different projects and the rust project was a challenge that wherever i went i started looking for rust and you know it's amazing how many times you find things that you look at and and if you're not really looking for them you don't see and i think the thing that we need to do is always be active with our photography and the ability to see um i call it abl always be looking and so you know rust is one of the topics that i concentrated on and i find the texture there and what i also find about rust is that i think there's always a, a story at one time they these things weren't rusty so this uh, is a image that i did in the faroe islands of uh, an old oil tank and uh, i just kind of liked it not only because of the rust but you know you have this new kind of silvery color with the drops of water so uh, elegantly displayed there. Then this is also in the Faroe Islands. And I love this one just because the the rust is gradations. It's like the top has rust and there's a different kind of rust. There's yellow rust in between and an area where the rust just hasn't started. So uh, the, these are in some sense, real high end abstracts, but there's so much beautiful detail in these pictures as you look at them and you, you want to explore them. It's not something you just look at and, and, and trek on. If you really look at it, you start really seeing things. And um, as many of you know, I'm a big advocate of, of printing. I, I'm one of those old school guys that believes uh, you don't have a photograph until you can hold it in your hand. And uh, as a result, when I print these images and you can see the kind of texture here, when you actually get this kind of image on a piece of paper, whether you know it's 11 by 17 or 30 by 40, you can always tell how effective it is based upon how people view the image and bring it closer to their faces, or if it's hanging on a wall, walk closer to it and start looking for all the details. And you know, this is the kind of stuff, it's only a bolt. So this is a one inch bolt on a, on a tank. And when you're looking at it standing six feet away, it's just a small bolt, but you don't see this kind of detail to be able to even photograph it until you walk up to it. And you know, this, as you can see, this was probably a solid piece of iron or steel at one time, and it's just kind of crumbling away and deteriorating. So, you know, it has its own story and it, the detail just is good. And not to mention, I kind of like the color of things. This is a, a whale oil tank in Antarctica. And just by the way, if you're looking for rust, the best rust is in the polar regions. I don't know why, but, uh, in the northern polar regions and the, the southern polar regions like Antarctica, 
just have the most incredible rust you can ever find. Um, and, you know, you've got these beautiful abstracts, almost kind of looks like a waves crashing on an ocean, but it's basically layers of, of rust peeling off. And, you know, eventually nature's going to reclaim this piece of metal. But it, it really is beautiful. And then you can see once again, you know, if you, these nuts and bolts and uh, the coloration and so forth that are inside these. Uh, you know, this is a... Uh, I guess kind of a cleat thing. I was walking on a dock in, um, I believe this might've been uh, the Faroe Islands. No, this was Ireland, excuse me. Um, and there was a, a, a jetty or a, a dock and on that dock were uh, these rings, which fishing boats tie up to. And I kind of just love that whole circle, uh, the lines and the, ar and the orange and the rust and so forth that are part of this. And this is a, another angle of it from a different corner uh, but you know, just I, I, you, I just love the colors and the way they play. This is a, a tank with a ladder on it. Uh, it looks really cool. It's kind of was probably painted bright red at one time, and as the paint fades away and uh, the rust is exposed, it begins to deteriorate and you know starts to make its own um, you know canvas. This is the inside of a, an old car in the Palouse a dashboard, and uh, you can see once again peeling paint and rust. Uh, an old padlock in uh, Greenland on a, on a cabin in Greenland. These are chains. Uh, this is in South Georgia Island. Uh, was lying on the ground. Once again, this is in Antarctica, but uh, more deteriorating rust in different layers and kind of crumbling away. So it's got a lot of detail. Now, if I was going to go back and do this again, um, I would do focus stacking on this, this shot. And something I've been working on on another project is getting back into doing macro photography and uh, using focus stacking. And um, uh, you, you'll see some more of that on my website in the very near future, I hope, as I'm progressing into this. And I've also got a really cool uh, macro lighting setup that was sent to me for uh, a review, which entails these two lights uh, by Godox and this little uh, reflector system that goes over it so that if you want to photograph bugs and so forth, it's really cool. And I know Jeremy's been doing a lot of macro work too. Thank you for a little bit of the inspiration there, Jeremy. Um, once again, you can see more of the rust. I love the gears, the old iron, the mechanical stuff. This is a old winch in um, Salvard. Uh, this is uh, rusty winches buried in volcanic dust on Deception Island in uh, the Antarctica. Once again, whale oil tanks, there was once a building around this, as you can see, the building has gone away and now the tanks themselves are more or less going away. 50 years from now, I don't even know if these tanks will be standing. And one of the things that I found really interesting was the way light plays off of uh, these, these big tanks. Uh, this is a, a group of tanks, uh, whale oil tanks, probably 50 feet high and uh, maybe six feet between each of the tanks. And uh, they're in Deception Island in, in Antarctica. But the light kind of comes through in such a way that if you spend some time there and are, you're a patient, these things turn into their own paintings like this. And it's um, very, very attractive. And also, they make a wonderful prints when, you're, when you make the prints because there's just nice texture to this whole rust. This is a ship in South Georgia Island uh, that obviously grounded itself and nature starts taking over and the deck with new plants and birds and so forth living on it. And then it allows me to go along the side of the boat with our Zodiac and find all these gems, you know, the nature growing on the rust, rust where it's actually rusted right through. And this is like a one inch hull. So, you know, nature has taken it over. And as you can see with the holes there, eventually nature always wins. And more details and abstracts on the ice, on the rust rather. And uh, other things, here's a ship with an anchor and uh, the, the eyelets and the painting, uh, the peeling paint. This is an old whaling ship. Oh, I'm sorry, I hit the reverse button, there you go. Uh, another shot close up, trying to use the composition with the circle, the diagonals and the, the chain coming into it. Old engines. Uh, this is a place called Gravikin. It's a whaling station on South Georgia Island. And they've got all sorts of incredible things. And you can see there's a, a big um, like valve or, or steering wheel crank kind of thing in that picture. And you can see that uh, basically it's already half gone. 
and slowly but surely, um, you know, nature reclaims all of this. Uh, once again, another nice shot inside uh, looking at the oil tanks. Uh, this, this is so much fun to go out. You know, we, we're so sometimes used to photographing landscapes and looking for compositions, but these things are found there. Look at that wrench. It's probably been sitting there for 50 years. It's got a story. Somebody used that wrench for something and left it there one day, and it's been there ever since. Uh, you know, I like this one with the composition of the chains around a stake, apparently holding this boat still in place. Uh, this is a collapsed tank, and you can see the ladder and all these aspects of it just have, has collapsed. And once again, you know, nature's just kind of slowly getting its way. One of the, the things that was really cool in South Georgia Island is the fact that there are these buildings, and these buildings are rusted. These are giant old whaling stations that are, you know, just sitting there. And you can't go in a lot of them because they're so dangerous. And you can see a bunch of elephant seals just lying on the beach there in front of all this an abandoned boat there on the right side of the image. And you can see a larger uh, view of it here. You know, and it's against a, a mountainous backdrop and so forth. It's, they're really quite spectacular places to visit. Valves, and this is in, in Salvard, so we move over. This is a, a part of a, a crane system that they used to mine, I think it was Jimson or something along that line. And then if you're lucky, uh, you stumble upon these places when uh, there's snow and, and different things along them. And they, once again, you get a whole nother view of an abstract. I, I did a whole lot of these and did some black and white conversions similar to what Jeff showed, and uh, they turned out quite well. And here's a tank. Now, in the early days, I guess, they explored Antarctica in tanks. But these, these uh, tanks here uh, were quite different. They were powered by rotary aircraft engines. So... Um, I have a whole series of uh, this series of tanks. There's three of them sitting there. And uh, it's just amazing that one day they just left. And these things just have kind of gone away over the, the decades that they, they've been sitting there. So what I'm doing with this project is I'm making uh, photo tins. Um, I get those from Hanamule. And uh, they sit on my shelves in my living room. But this is uh, one where I'm working with Sal Digital. I just want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I'm making a book. And so I'm using software from Sal Digital. There's the uh, website address. And they make these very high-end books. Now, there's a number of different companies that do books like Blurb and uh, Adorama has a, 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 a company you can do. And they're kind of the same. But I think from what I've told, been seen, uh, Sal Digital just does amazing stuff, and there's software they have. You can see it right there. You can lay these books out on iPads, uh, your laptops, or your big uh, desktop computer, as well as an iPhone. And they give you the pages, and you can drag your images in. You can decide you know, if you want to use some of their templates. The, there's a series of templates you can select and drop your images in. Um, they make it really easy, but the quality of the books they produce are really incredible. And this just shows you some of the book formats that are available from, from them. So I'll be using this company to make the books. And once I'm done with the books, I'll be happy to share it with everybody. Most likely it'll be a story on the website and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks for letting me share this with you. I'll stop my screen sharing right now. Um, so Kevin, Paul was asking, where is, South, where is South Georgia Island located? Okay, South Georgia Island is uh, off the coast of um, South America uh, in the, well, the South Atlantic Ocean. And essentially, it's somewhere between the, the tip of South America and kind of Antarctica. So there are many trips if you're interested in going, and I've done several of them. My wife has joined me, and she's online here today, too, I see. Um, and it's like a 19, 20-day trip, and you leave from Ushuaia, and you sail to South Georgia Island, which is one of the most incredible places you can see. So you can look up South Georgia Island, find it off the coast of South America on, you know, to, to the right or on the east side uh, of South America. And um, it has more teeming wildlife, mountains like you can't believe, lenticular clouds, glaciers. Uh, Jeff's been there. We, we've, it's, you can't describe it. There's one spot when we visited there that our uh, expedition leader set up and we had to follow these flags and we kind of took a hike, maybe a half mile hike. Uh, there was a river we had to cross, and they were there to help us cross this river and waded through this river. 
And then we kind of waved and came up against on top of this hill. And as we came over the hill, people were just dropping to their knees. And on the other side of this hill, there was a valley. And it was like um, just moving. And it had probably 50,000 uh, king penguins uh, sitting in this uh, place. So such a mass of life standing there, you know, fall, going up the hill and coming back down the hill to the ocean. Uh, it was something to behold and um it's quite special and it's kind of why i guess i've been to antarctica i did my 25th trip there this year um truly an amazing place so i don't know if i'm going back because i've been there so many times and there's still a few other places i'm doing um but i do a lot of workshops i have some room on my greenland workshop by the way and i'll just announce it to you um not that i'm trying to make commercials out of this but i have uh, two or three spots left on the greenland trip and we're going someplace that uh, has never been explored before by uh, photo expeditions and so forth. Um, and it, it's going to prove to have not only the best of nature, uh, whales and fjord systems, but a lot of different communities uh, and an abandoned uh, army and air force base. And it's going to be totally different than what I've uh, done before when we visited Scoresbury Sound. And the Greenland government has put a lot of restrictions on visiting the Scoresbury sound um, meaning speed of boats and areas you can't visit anymore so uh, we found this new location and uh, we have this little expedition yacht that will only have 11 passengers and myself on with uh, two expedition team leaders and the, the ship's crew uh, amazing meals amazing trip and you fly from iceland into greenland get on the boat and uh, we do a nine-day trip so it's pretty cool so if anybody's interested I still have a couple openings on my Palouse workshop, second Palouse workshop, um, too, if anybody's interested in exploring the Palouse. And that's only five people on that trip. So uh, just so you know, we've, we've got a few of these things. And I do, do have a couple openings left in the Faroe Islands workshop. We have two openings left in the Faroe Islands, which is an amazing place to visit. So you can check those out at rockhopperworkshops.com. Okay, enough of my commercials. Uh, Holger, yeah, did the you rest was really out? great. I, I enjoyed that. Thanks. Uh, and Seattle here has a lot of rust too. You were saying the the Arctic and Antarctic, but Seattle is pretty good. A lot of that stuff reminded me of some things I've done that I've forgotten about. So you, well, that's cool, John. Go I, you know, do some I'm, more work with with that. I've got to get back out to uh, the the Seattle. I want to do uh, the Olympic National Park again, and also go up mm -hmm. into the 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 mountains on you know the land side of things. So uh, Seattle is always a place I I've enjoyed and. Uh, that you're so lucky to live in a region like that. I think it's one of the coolest places in the country to live. You've got so, so much Kevin, available to you. Yes, Jeff. Um, Suzanne Mathia asks, "What is your favorite paper for printing rust to get the um, color and the dynamic range?" Uh, right now, I, I have fallen in love with a breed of paper from Red River, um, and there's also. Uh, Epson has a, a paper called Plantine. Uh, how do we, I think I'm saying that right. Um, and it's one of their legacy papers. And it also has kind of a nice sheen to it and a beautiful texture. And you you print on those two papers that, that kind of have a, a luster finish to them and they just pop. Uh, so I love doing that, especially if you put light on, on them at the same time. So that's what uh, papers I've been using. Um, I'm exploring a number of newer papers that are coming out. We'll have some things to say about those. But the, the new Burita 2 papers that are out there, both by Canson. Canson has a kind of a luster one and a matte one, I believe. And um, Epson has a Burita 2, and so does Red River, just has a beautiful well, Burita. We'll have to do a session on our favorite printers. And yeah, we, we, we'll be getting together soon. We have a new printer from Epson coming in sometime in the next few weeks, the 5370. And uh when we do that uh, jeff i'd like you to come down and uh, dano's going to come and we're going to do stuff on some of the new software um that uh, eliminates a lot of the problems that epson printers have been having and uh, we'll get into talking more about some new papers and different things like that and i also do mean, fine art printing workshops by the way and you can come yeah. and spend a couple of days with jeff and uh john panazzo and myself and uh it's all printing we have four well we'll have five printers in the near future so everybody gets to make a lot of prints and big prints and it's a lot of fun so uh, you can check that out too. Um, we have one coming up in a couple of weeks, and we have one opening left in that one. So, and and Kevin, you missed the comment that I posted in the chat. Sorry, uh, I wasn't looking at the like, chat. Yeah, you just like to photograph stuff that's older than you are. Yeah, there's something about that. I'm I'm coming to terms with it. It's my way of of dealing with um, 
you know, the aging um, that I'm, I'm uh, facing, you know, just turned 70. And, you know, it's the number is pretty big, but I tell you, I'm feeling like I'm still 40. So uh, you're not going to keep a good dog I'm, down with me. I'm turning 70 next week, too. Uh, Happy so John, birthday. <laughs> John gets to show photos. Holger, did you ever figure let's this try, Let's out? try Holger. And Karen, yes. we can ask them where the workshops are before we move on. Are they all at your place, Kevin? The fine art printing workshops are at the Indianapolis Art Center, where I'm an artist in residence. And I have a very large studio at my disposal there where all my printing and gear and different things are. Uh, good lighting setups, too, so we can do you know photography and so forth. So, And if anybody is from the Indianapolis area online here, next week we have Indie Captures on Thursday evening from 6 to 9. And we've got two wonderful speakers there. Uh, David Pulmer, who does uh, food photography, and Corey Eastway, who does some of the most amazing uh, portrait illustration, a lot of it done in, in Photoshop, and they're going to both be there to talking and, and giving demonstrations. And uh, it runs 6 to 9 next week at the Indianapolis Art Center called Indie Captures. And um, just look up Indianapolis Art Center, and you'll see the event right on their homepage and kind of click through. We do those four times a year at the Art Center. And also, by the way, in June... We're also starting something new there called Indie Talks. And what we're bringing in is creative artist and Art Wolf is coming in for two days. On Friday night, he'll be giving a presentation. Um, and Art's presentations are always amazing. We have a beautiful auditorium with brand new seats being put in and all, all sorts of cool stuff. And then on Saturday, he'll be around to basically do workshop formats. We're going to be doing a couple of different things and critiques and so forth. So uh, cool. look for some information on that real soon on my website. All right, Holger, how about you? Are you ready? It's I got the settings right, but it still doesn't work. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's with us all being hosts or something. Okay. Well, I, I no, it, it's you're German, that's why. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's probably that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, look, you know, what we'll do is uh we'll just take your we'll figure out how to do it and and uh yeah. before we start the next one, we'll give you some time to, to catch up, okay? Yeah, it's all good. John, how about you? Yeah, I can show some pictures. Oh, um, I love it. Let's see here. How do we do this? We go to share screen. And see. Are you seeing Nosferatu? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so this is my pandemic photo. This is a friend of mine, um, cancer survivor. And this is how she showed up for Halloween. Um, and just made me think of the pandemic and getting started again after the pandemic with the photography and trying to get things in focus. So I did a bunch of stuff out of focus for a while and I started going into some abstract work. So I'm just going to go through the photos I've been doing. Um, I'm not a landscape photographer like these other folks. I just don't see things in the landscape. I just like working with people, which is different for me because I started as a still life advertising photographer shooting 11 by 14 cameras for products. Um, somehow I evolved to photos of people. Um, so these are playing with LED lights and lasers and then just long exposures and movement textures in Photoshop. And, and those are really built, nice, John. Holy cow. Thanks. I built this out of foam core. Uh, and I realized I like to put things between people and the and the camera. So a lot of times there's string curtains or beaded curtains that I work out with. As you can see in these. Oh. Beautiful lighting and texture. Really well done. Oh. Thanks. Friend of mine's young great magician here in Seattle, so I try to help him out. Um, it's a plastic sheet. Eventually, these people break through the sheet, so I do this kind of series of them breaking through the whole thing. Cool. Then I've had this built this white set in my basement. I'm never, what most people don't realize, almost everything here is photographed in my basement, which has got about an eight foot ceiling and maybe eight foot wide by a fourteen foot deep area. Uh, so I built this white set where I do these silhouettes and then work on them in Photoshop. This is done with an eight-foot ceiling. You don't have to jump that high to get that look. Started working with dancers. Brought out the ring light to get my old look from the 70s. 
playing with shadows. Oh, John, these are great. <laughs> Thanks. So this is what I did, what I missed during the pandemic and just got rolled back into it now. But now it's all as a hobby. I closed my business during the pandemic. And I'm just, actually what happened is my wife was running the business side of things. She got tired of it. She closed the business and she fired me. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm an unemployed photographer now, and but I'm shooting more than I ever was. But no, Another. you're retired, not you're not unemployed. You're choosing yes, okay. the work. <laughs> I think it's, I just like the sound of it. And yes, I do shoot men also. Um, but more textures in Photoshop and textures. Oh, that's cool. And motion. And my ah, face. <laughs> that's great. This Iman Lazara Zhu, um, she's got a PhD in astrophysics. She served a time on a Russian submarine. Her father was a director of the Russian Bolshoi Ballet. She's from um, what's the region of between France and Spain. Uh, I can't think of the name of the area now. Um, Basque region of Spain and uh, France. And she makes her living as a professional juggler. And um, shuggles pineapples. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you can throw at her. Uh, she's also a cancer survivor recently. Oh, my heavens. What a story and more fruit and then we took a trip to alaska and i got to photograph this eagle in flight we came back to seattle we have eagles in flight here you didn't have to do all that traveling went out to maine took a picture of a bird came back to seattle we have a lot of birds you got rust too they all come into seattle oh yeah rust rust is great here i don't have many 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 rust photos in here but i'll collect some for you kevin uh, and then just a typical Seattle sunrise. Amazing city. And I do sometimes just wander around. This was out at Green Lake here. I was intrigued by this reflection of this um, stick in the water. And as I was composing the photo, this feather just floated by serendipitously and just made the whole thing. So that got me into shooting my dead flowers from the rose bush outside and a couple other plants that were at the end of their lives. So God, they're exceptional. Jeez. These, I think, believe we're all ring lights. So we get this nice direct light filling in mm -hmm. all the shadows. And just happened to crawl across this. I didn't even know it was there until I was taking the photo. <laughs> <laughs> Grapes didn't turn out great this year, but they were still made a nice photo. But of course, it always comes back to people. And I like to get them to laugh in the studio. We all have a really great time. I do the series of the chair photos, just people in this chair, various chairs. I've got like six chairs that I've used over the years. A lot of my friends are acrobats and circus performers. Dancers. And then I have this other project called the Cocoon Series, where I've taken people like dancers and wrapped them in the stretch fabric and work with them like this. And again, these are all in my little tiny basement studio. Just about at the end here. shooting strobe or continuous these so far have been strobe but that's it's we're coming to something here um this is an odd one for me because those packages at the bottom was one of my tests with the generative film i just realized it when i put it in here that's oh i shouldn't show that but oh you can show it that's kind of cool I, you kind of did it like that <laughs> we all have to play with it regardless of yeah. how we feel about it yeah <laughs> yeah well so you, you mentioned it that's good enough yeah I mean, the, the packages at the bottom is the only part. I, I added the branches myself. I added the, the ornament up top. So it's just those boxes in the snow on the ground that was added by you. It's a great so, model, though. Holy, did you? Uh, yeah, she's great. Wow, look at the, how old is how old is she? Oh, I don't know. I'm probably thirty or so. Really? Late twenties, early thirties. Kevin, don't ask a woman's age. No, <laughs> but you know, it's it kind of implies. I mean, it almost looks like um, 
you know, a child at Christmas. I mean, it's just, a, I'm, I, I'm immersed in this image. It's yeah, so she's cool. a professional clown, a uh, balloon maker for parties and things like that. So this was her Santa Alba, I mean, um, elf outfit that she wanted photographed this year. The position of her feet, everything there, John, is so strong. Holy cow. Thanks. That's really nice. Marty, uh, John, and this, so as Jeff was saying, my new adventure is continuous light. I uh, got a bunch of lights from Nanlite, uh, purchased them. Uh, so um, LED lighting, because I've been dyed in the wool strobe. I bought my first Normans back in 1979, and I've only used strobe since 1979. And this is my first foray into continuous light and working with higher ISOs and wide open apertures and the like. So these last few are all going to be with continu with continuous light. How do you find uh, working with those, um, you know, between working with strobe and working with continuous light, any difference in how you shoot and approach the subject or? Not on the subject. I mean, if, if it's still using the same modifiers usually and the, and the light is just getting used to, well, I always shoot on a tripod. I have Parkinson's. So because of the shake, I've always been a tripod users anyway. So it hasn't changed much, uh, except that I can shoot wider open. And I was never good at gelling strobes and mm -hmm. with the L with the leds you can get an rgb leds that you can dial in the colors you want and not have to worry about taping on gels and figuring all that out if you want to change a color you just change a number on the back of the strobe instead of pulling the light down and changing gels and the like so that part i'm really enjoying good cool so this is the last the last few of those john charlie gibson was asking do you approach people to photograph or do they approach you it's kind of both. Um, as I say, I have a lot of friends are performers, so it's a lot of word of mouth people coming to me. Um, I don't approach strangers. I've never been that social for that sort of thing, but um, I'm part of a bunch of groups on on Facebook and the like too, where people know me and I've developed a reputation over the years. So people, it's more people coming to me. That's an amazing collection of images. Thanks. This for it really is. Lunar New Year. Decided to try to snow in the studio. The snow is all added in Photoshop, actually. And these were done two days ago. A friend of mine said she had these cicadas she wanted to photograph with. So that's these last three images here. Ooh. One hell of a collection, John. Yeah, for <laughs> that's I'm sure that's just a drop in the bucket. Yeah, Very so nice. said, it's since <clears throat> I retired, I'm busier than ever. Makes me feel guilty for not trying hard enough. Oops, my camera turned off. There it goes. There we are. There we are. Excellent. John, thank you very much. That was uh, sure. very inspirational. Oh, yeah, just wow. <laughs> oh, I was going to show you my little portrait set this yeah. panel light then i've got this little and i use this on the portrait of john just a little fill light and then a little key light like this and uh that way i can go ahead and uh um shoot portraits in a set uh that is really kind of tiny mm -hmm. um the other thing i was going to say is that uh, uh i discovered recently i did a shoot with my friend carl corey and I, I know this is going to be hard for everybody to believe but i do occasionally make mistakes and i accidentally had the camera set on auto ISO and I had been shooting manually outside and I shot the portrait of Carl at uh, 1 750th of a second at F11, which I thought, oh, the, this is working great. But I mean, the exposures looked fine on the, on the uh, viewfinder in the back of the LCD. And I got back to the studio and processed the work and oddly enough, I'm looking and it's like, this is grainier than shit. Uh, and then I discovered that um, <laughs> I had, uh, the ISO was 25,000. 
and <laughs> Lightroom's uh, enhanced noise AI function uh, made them usable. I mean, that's Very not cool. like shooting at, at ISO 100, but darn it, it was pretty good. So Karen, you had a question about the strobes adjusting colors. It's the, it's the continuous light that I can adjust the colors with. The strobes I have to put gels on. Yeah, some of the lighting available today, um, you know, LCD wise, not only is it really small, kind of like what Jeff showed you, but uh, you, you can do a lot with it. It's really light to carry around. And, um, you know, you, the amazing things are you can dial in color. Um, and one of the next, uh, somewhere in the future, I'll, I'll show you some of the lighting that's been sent to me. I have a, a strip light, which does all sorts of different colors and little pocket ones and different things like that, that um, uh, I can share with you. And there's some pretty cool stuff that is being done with this. These, yeah, this I put stuff. a link to Nanlite in the chat. Uh, let's see, Jen Bell was asking um, training. Uh, my training is, I mean, I had college photo classes with a really great instructor, Ed Scully, um, back in the 70s. Then I worked in a photo studios in New York for a while. Uh, and then I went and worked for Adobe for 20 years. And um, so photo has been both a business and a hobby. And for the past few years, I was running a headshot business here in, in Seattle. Um, so. Cool. Joseph, you, you have your hand raised. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, go ahead. Hey, I, I, yeah, I just have a question. You know, I, the continuous light thing is, uh, it's very interesting to me. I, I remember sitting in Jeff's studio. He's got this big light. I'm like, oh, geez, the thing is bright. Uh, but now he's showing me something smaller. That I guess, uh, Jeff, you can take that on location with you. What, what, who's manufacturing those lights? The uh, panel light like this is a Ray Leno, R-A-L-E-N-O. The little... Uh, uh, um, the little um, bright lights, uh, are the same thing that um, John was talking about. Um, so, have, have you uh, shot any portraits of that little panel? I mean, that doesn't look very large. Yes, I have shot portraits. In fact, I could embarrass Ian by showing uh, um, one of the portraits that I shot, but uh, of him out on location. But let me show you what the little panel light looks like. Uh, everybody see this? Yep. Yeah. yeah. This is um, ISO 25,000 shot with the uh, panel light of uh, Carl Corey. So um, uh, I could show you the before and after the AI noise reduction, but I find that embarrassing because it exposes my mistake. I can show you this and, and you can't see my mistake. So does that help, <laughs> Joe? Yeah, and, and you know, you didn't have to tell us you made a mistake, but we would have never known. <laughs> well, isn't that kind of cool that Jeff's actually admitting the mistakes now? You, you've come a long way, Jeff. <laughs> Therapy helps. Yes, it does. Um, at this time, what we can do is uh, anybody that wants to unmute themselves, ask questions, or start a discussion, um, you know, feel free to, to do so. Uh, yeah, Jan was asking a couple of questions over in the chat. I answered them there. Oh, Jan, maybe we can just unmute sure Jan, and Jan them. can he can say whatever he wants. I mean, whatever way you want to do it, Jan. So she was asking if I, what I did at Adobe in there, I ran the community forums. Right. Um, I used to keep uh, Mr. Shuey in check. Yeah, he tried to moderate me in the Photoshop forums. I just, you know, it was like, I, but I finally got the meet him in person and realized, oh, he's just a little fellow. I'll be nice to him. When we stand next to each other, we've been called Shuey and Mini Shuey. John or uh, Jan, uh, if you have uh, questions, go ahead and put it up. We'll just read it on the chat if you can do that. And the other thing that was funny is John and I were shooting along the uh, uh, Pebble Beach coast and we were both shooting at sunset. And what was funnier than hell is he showed a shot that he shot, the exact same shot that I shot, 
but his was six or eight inches shorter than me, and I liked his better. So it uh, sometimes short is better. Go ahead, go ahead, Ian. So um, I'm happy to see that Jack's here. Hi, Jack. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, registra uh, copyright registration, and that is how is everyone or how Jeff or Jack dealing with the uh, the spreadsheet requirement, the spreadsheet form? Um, uh, that certainly is burdensome. Uh, how it's a pain in the ass. It's it slowed down my registrations from taking less than twenty minutes to taking me about forty five minutes. Um, it, it's I, I I don't have an answer for that. It's you know I um, I I I go to text edit in um, in my um, on my Mac, and I put it into text edit so I can just copy and paste in all of them at one time. The hard part. You know, getting them on that spreadsheet is real easy. That takes me just uh, a few minutes. It's the putting them into the registration form um, because it, you only allowed so many spaces. Uh, and then, so you just take a guess, as, you grab as many as you can, put them in, see where it cut one off, um, you know, eliminate that, go back into the spreadsheet, pick the next group, you know, because I can only pick about, depending on how long the file name is, anywhere from 50 to 90 usually at a time. And I'm going to register 750. So it takes me a long time to get them into the registration form. When, how often are you doing your registrations, Jack? Uh, it all depends on trips. Um, you know, I just did a big trip to, to Norway, England, and, and Iceland, uh, and the Faroe Islands, which are great. Mm -hmm. That was a huge surprise. I'd love to go back to the Pharaohs. Oh, wow. um, that's one of my favorite places. So that was two registrations for me. You know, I had to do the edit now because you're limited to 750. In the old days, I would just take that whole trip. If it was, you know, 13, 14, 15,000 images, just register on one registration. Now I got to edit it down to, um, you know, seven, it, lots of 750. So, um, these days, because I'm not doing it commercially anymore, it's just basically on trips. Um, I'm off to Vietnam and Cambodia tomorrow. So that'll be another probably one or two registrations when I get back. Yeah, things are things are changing that way. But you know, if, you, if you have to do that, that's the way to do it, I suppose. So, and nothing's yeah, easy I register anymore. No, I register before I post anything online too, so. Um, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll we'll think about doing uh, rather than have a photographer uh, come online. Uh, a year or two ago, I talked to uh, and had somebody write an article for the site that dealt a lot with copyright, uh, both you know in on the photographic side, but you know um, music and intellectual property and different things along those lines. And maybe we can do one where we can uh, talk about what copyright's all about and the importance of it and where and how it takes place and specifically what happens when you start sharing your images online and some of these social media spots and well things. we have jack and his his cohort ed greenberg uh, and they're actually pretty entertaining so uh, maybe <laughs> one, uh, of the th one of the one of the things yeah, happy, I'd happy to yeah that'd be cool um we'll keep that in mind and one of the things that i'd, I'd love if um if anybody that's online here has ideas for the future or different formats or uh different things you'd like to learn you know we can do uh you know one one of these chats where we just uh bring different camera gear and talk about the camera gear we're using and uh how we're using it um, um we can talk about addictions you know i've i've alleviated with the help of my wife uh, my camera bag addiction uh, and uh, i'll be doing an article about that when you just imagine a whole garage floor filled with camera bags God, I, was, I, I think I have five camera, six camera bags that I refuse to get rid of now. Um, but I think there's a lot of things that we can talk about, you know, upgrading cameras. Is it necessary to upgrade every time a new camera uh, model comes out these days? And it's not like it was years ago when the features were changing uh, tremendously. So um, there's a lot of topics we, we can discuss and uh, we'll try to, to do that over the long, long haul here. So uh, please email me. You've got my email and uh, you can always go on the forum at the photopxl.com and leave a comment and start a discussion. Joseph, you got another question? Go ahead. Or yeah, that's what your question. Uh, just to say that uh, 
yeah, the, the spreadsheet's, you know, a little weird, but uh, all of this beats what we used to do, filling it out on paper forms, you know, so uh, copyright registration's come a long way, I think. Oh. Uh, not, not quite as cumbersome as, as good old days. Jack, I was, uh, I did some research on this, uh, Googling, and I did find a workaround using photo mechanic. Um, I think I saw a video actually. Um, so maybe if you can Google photo mechanic and copyright and take a look at what you find, I didn't save it. And as I watched it, it didn't, I, I, I was unsure about it, but maybe you might be interested or w might want to take a look and I'm, I'm going to go back and find it myself. I'll, I'll definitely take a look at that. And, but it's, it's like I said, the hard part is importing everything with the restrictions they got to space uh into the form because you want it you you want to list each each file name into the um, registration because there's been an issue with if you don't that if you have multiple infringements on something it's only one infringement the reason that they make you put every title in is um so that each one stands on its own it's an individual registration of the image not a group registration when you do a group um Kevin, one of the things i i like to hear some discussion on i know it's probably not what a lot of people want to hear is on artificial intelligence um because i really see it as a generational thing and i think people should just be aware of what a younger generation is looking at 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 uh, artificial intelligence it's much different than people in in uh, uh my age group let's say usually I, I, Jack, I, that's a good good uh, one to do on. And I, I did recently sit in on a, a program here in town where a photographer not only talked about AI, but actually did some really good examples of AI, completely generative AI, as well as AI blended in with photographs, kind of like what John did in, in his image. Um, and, you know, I think many of us older folks are probably more of a, a purist nature. Um, and have our own beliefs about it. But as everything else, I mean, this, these are tools and we're kind of using a lot of AI and Photoshop these days uh, and, and Lightroom where there's, you know, there's some good tools. I mean, you know, content aware is kind of an AI. And of course now there's generative fill. So uh, you, you got a good point and I think there's different levels of it. And um, if you'd like, I can try to arrange for somebody uh, we kind of have guest book now through March, but I'll start looking at somebody to uh, specifically focus on AI photography. There's um well, Charlie's pointed out of interest in English that John Russell's doing a lot of AI work. Yep. And he'll probably talk about that in the next one. I'm, yeah, I'm but sure. he he's doing it and and not <laughs> he doesn't keep it secret. He mentions right. the fact that he's using generative fill and he'll often show the before and the after shot. Um now, the interesting thing about AI and the hype that the media has um, basically inundated us, inundated us with, uh, we've had, in essence, AI, uh, uh, CGI, computer-generated imagery in motion pictures for three decades. Uh, you know, Photoshop is an example of, quote, AI, meaning that uh, you know, you're not showing reality, you're manipulating reality. And uh, so, but here's the other thing is that um, uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, I don't, and, and this has to do with copyright, I come back to, I used to be known and spent a lot of time and effort and got paid a shitload of money to do impossible work by doing multiple captures and then combining them in a photorealistic manner. But all those pixels were mine. And uh, the whole concept of AI uh, and whether or not AI images can be copyrighted, currently they can't, um, which puts a damper on intellectual the concept of intellectual property. So, uh, yeah, I think it'd be an interesting discussion. And there are some people that, uh, uh, that one guy that submitted an AI image won the contest and then loudly proclaimed that it was, was an this, artificial image. 
That was a uh, Sony. He's contest. actually pretty interesting because he did that on purpose uh, to expose that. Now, if you if you uh, if you think about AI in terms, ultimately, it's like Terminator. Um, you know, the the machines will decide that humans are just an unnecessary virus and they'll get rid of us. Um, and then even Stephen Hawking thought that AI will replace humans altogether. So there you go. Yeah, there. Well, but that's, I doubt that many of us will be different. around for that one. <laughs> but it's, it's but that's, interesting that's, how uh, it just be. I'm sorry. No, go that's, ahead. Uh, uh, that's artificial general intelligence is what they're scared about, <laughs> not the generative AI that we deal with as photographers. No. Well, there's, there's different AIs, you know, <laughs> so you have to be specific as what you're talking about. The yeah. AI is not is a pretty big, broad catch-all. Well, based on, on, on this discussion, um, I'll work with uh, John and um, Jeff and Holger, and we'll try to come up with something in the future uh, as a, a speaker talking about AI. and how yeah, It's, it's, it's interesting how it can just become part of your work, because even that one of the, the, the person there in the snow when I was going through the photos this morning, I looked at it and I said, I don't remember creating snow. How did, where did that come from? Then I went, oh, generative fill. I mean, I forgot that I even used it there. Uh, you know, there's the neural filters. I'm also, one of the things mm -hmm. that I like about the AI now that uh, in, in Lightroom is the focus. Um, uh, simulator. You know, simulator or whatever you like to yeah. call it. And yeah, yeah. I find it's really good for iPhone type photos that have great depth of field. And yeah, now you can use the it. iPhone and select the subject and selectively blur out the the background and put some separation to it. And, you know, it's also, I think, showing a lot about where mobile photography is going to be going in the future. Um, but I think some of the mobile phones already created a depth map. They, kind of they do in the portrait mode, but, you know, now, you know, like in Lightroom, you know, they've got that as a tool. So you can do it. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty fun to, to see what you can do. Like, especially if you like photograph the, a subject on the street or something and uh you know you just had like f8 and you really wanted 2.8 you know now you can you know kind of dial in and selectively begin to separate the subject from the background and uh lightroom and adobe are calling it like a what they call it early release meaning it's not final yet um but they put it in um it, it's pretty cool and a lot of the things in lightroom god i never thought i'd be talking about lightroom uh, having been a capture one guy for so long but um I, I've come over. Thank you, Jeff, for helping me do that. Well, yeah, you know, uh, it, it took a while, but um, uh, uh, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> never mind. Okay, yeah. it's probably best. Mitchell just, Mitchell just put a link in the chat to a series of portraits where you have to guess if they were AI or photographs. Yeah, I know so I took that, one of these tests a few weeks ago and I failed. <laughs> Well, the one thing that I will say about AI is oh. that it is scary good. Nice one, Steve. And that's the thing. I mean, um, it has taken, it is less than 24 months. These AIs have been basically self-educating themselves on what stuff looks like. Now, admittedly, they they have a hard time with hands and arms. Um, and fingers. <laughs> and fingers. But the thing is that it, it's, scary how fast they've gotten so good which is the thing that is so alarming yes pretty pretty scary um before we go on we can continue discussion for a little while longer but you know we we are up against the one hour time frame and um I We're just at 90 wanna, minutes actually yeah i think you know we we, we kind of need to the the like somewhere along the line you have to end end it <laughs> people have things to do and so forth but um uh, first off i'd like to thank everybody and, and what uh, kevin i just wanted to say happy valentine's day <laughs> oh jeff will you be my valentine oh you make me may make me so happy <laughs> <laughs> anyway everybody thank you so much for being part of this um to be notified of of uh new uh, chats when they happen 
if you would go to photo pxl and just register yourself into the mailing list there uh, you can become a member and essentially you're just kind of putting your information up there but put your bio and so forth there too we have a, a very special way of doing it but then that will go into the mailing list that uh, you will use and also when we put uh, articles up that announce the next photo chat or other things like that uh, you'll get notified of those and uh, you can be part of these um, remember we do record those so everybody that uh, had signed up can get a recording and uh, we can also make that uh, some place where we can put it on a our photo pxl youtube channel so uh, we'll be doing that along the way so thank you this has been uh, the, the the christening of the second uh go second around coming. and we all have john to thank for this uh, john mm -hmm. what you did during the pandemic having just tried to put these together i don't know how you did it but I know, you, know were just, you got so much energy and such great work and um, the people you, you talk to and the resources you, you've already provided in those past recordings are, are tremendous. We will be visiting and revisiting some of those people that you've already talked yeah, to. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, but I, I got to say, man, I, I respect the hell out of what you did there and uh, enjoyed going to many of those uh, mm -hmm. during that time. It was a crazy time of all of our lives, but... Uh, you made it a little bit easier for us to tolerate it. So I want to thank you. And Holger, thanks, thanks for being part of this group too. You're doing a great job with the, the graphics and things. And we really want to see your work. You do a lot of great black and white and other things. And um, uh, next time we'll make some time for you to catch up when we figure out how to handle your security issues. Um, yeah. <laughs> Two things. Um, we had uh, the most people at one time was 45 today. I think that was pretty good for the first time. And when you were talking about Sal Digital, uh, who you want to do your uh, books. your your books, books with, uh, everybody should follow them on on I think it was Instagram because they are really generous on the offers of you. You can try out making a book which is like a hundred dollar value, and they they don't charge you for it at all. And it's really easy to to get in. They just drop them a mail say I want to try this, and they they'll give you the hundred or the free book. So it's. Yeah. Just, their, their, their software is what makes it easy. Um, you know, uh, I'm probably the worst designer in the world. And uh, <laughs> Holger, you, you're quite talented with what you've produced for us already. But, uh, you know, being able to use their templates to put these together. And, you know, it's a project. It requires work. And it means you have to find time. But, you know, I think we will put so much effort into taking the picture. I'm always surprised at how little effort people do once they've got the picture it just kind of sits on the cloud or the computer and never yeah. makes it to print or never makes it uh you know to one form or another where you can pack fully it's, not finished. it's just not finished if it's not printed it's just not finished. that's really it's my feeling all together that's why we do these printing things and i'm you know i'm always printing but um we need to see that the newer generation that is coming online feels the same way because there's just way too much stuff in the cloud you know, one of the things that uh, we also will have to do a discussion on, and Jeff and I have talked about this in the past, is, you know, as we're getting older, we got to decide, you know, what we're doing with all our stuff. My my wife has been talking about um, this thing called Scandinavian death cleaning. I guess it means you just throw a lot of shit out so you leave nothing behind when you die. And of course, we're always, uh, you know, relooking at the wills and, uh, you know, all my little companies like Rockhopper and Photo PXL, I've got people in the will that will take them over in regards but you know what do we do with our collection of photographs and so we'll probably have an open discussion somewhere along the line if we have a guest that can't make it or something where we'll discuss you know what we do with our, our archive i know yeah. you know jeff and i have talked about it and um what do we do with our equipment um luckily i have the indianapolis art center i'm kind of in discussion with them um but uh, just those are some things that we want to talk about too in the future so just to give you guys a head up on what the potential of these photo chats um, can yeah. be. John, yeah, Jeff, well, that, that's something that. Go, sorry. Yeah, that's something I think would be really interesting is to get uh, somebody on here to talk about legacies. Uh, yep. What do you do? You know, I don't care what happens to the cameras. My kids, if they want to throw them out, can throw them out. You know, that's <laughs> not a big deal. It's just a machine. But I look at, you know, I still got filing cabinets full of film and and plus hard drives full of images and where do they go who's going to see them who's going to preserve them who's going to maybe market them someday i don't know uh, but i also would like to address the terms of service uh, as long as i'm still here uh jeff gave us wonderful little spiel about the terms of service for this chat and he mentioned uh unruly new yorkers 
I don't know how many I don't know how many New Yorkers are actually on this on this chat, but I just want to well me too. And there's Jack, but uh and John. Uh I, I want to congratulate you guys for holding your tongues and no profanity. Uh although I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to get into that because I live in Chicago. You're, Joe, you're from Chicago. Well, I am now. Yeah. Well, yeah. You've I mean, lost hot your, dogs. you've lost your New York edge. Jack lives out in the country now. He's not a New Yorker. He's not. No, a I'm still in the city. That's that's where I am right now. But Joe, if it would make you feel better, um, fuck you. No, thank there you, you go. You. I, it took an no, hour and a half, you. but now it's coming out. <laughs> there it is. No, I don't think Wait. I lost my edge, Jeff. I think I'm just a very polite guy these days. That's all. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's fine too. You know. Yeah. Even Jeff yeah. is, you know, Jeff is re reformed. It's really nice. It's like, wow. So we're quite nice. All right. Well, look, I'm going to end the recording so we can at least make people watching this. Um, uh, we're almost at feature length um, motion picture time frame here. But, um, <laughs> well, thank you all. Yep. You know, I want to say thanks. And um, if anybody wants to stay online, you know, keep it open for a minute. You can open your microphones, and um, then eventually I'm just going to end the meeting, and we'll we'll be done. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget hey. February 28th, Russell. Brown will be here. That's going to be a, a, a very, very fun uh, meeting. And um, I'll be logging in from Hawaii. I expect a Hawaii so, shirt, Jeff, not your, your Speedo. <laughs> <laughs> Had to throw that one in there. Nice, nice to get the upper hand once in a while. You think. <laughs> By the way, you know, Jeff, we know you're an addict because you went out and bought an underwater housing for your iPhone. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's 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 a sure sign that you've gone off the deep end. Yeah. Well, I didn't I didn't buy it for the the my newest uh, uh, camera, and I was showing it the Nikon uh, Z8, and well, here that's there nice. Nikon Z8, and I had to buy uh, Thom Hogan's damn book to figure out how the fuck to use the goddamn camera that the 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 custom functions and and all the different functions i just i uh, so i was i was befuddled and confused did wow. you that's amazing <laughs> what did you download the new software for the z8 the, the new firmware yeah new firmware yeah, yeah. all right I'm, I'm ending the recording just so you know just i gotta yeah.